my my talk is not really um so it's a little bit um it touches various uh areas it's uh, about avicenna uh which uh, who was a medieval philosopher and uh, his concept of time and uh, three four dimensionalism i call it so basically the talk uh, will be divided into two parts in the first part i will talk about his concept of time and then in the second one about how objects persist through time. And uh, I started this because I bumped into his um, theory of uh, persistence through time uh, randomly uh, when I was uh, writing this um, a paper on, on the way objects persist through time. And I found it that uh, no one has studied that and I found it uh, very interesting and that's why I'm presenting that. But before going through how what is his theory of persistence of uh, persistence of the object through time? I think it's uh, important to present what is the um, the view that he has on time. In fact, I will start by presenting better what is its notion of time, to to better understand also what it's uh, its its relationship with the objects and the persistence of the object. And in fact, for example, we will be able to say whether time exists or not or if it is an accident of motion or vice versa of fundamental importance in fact because if uh, if um, the objects are accidental with respect to time or the other way around if, if if time is just accidental to the object then we also have consequences on on how these things persist through it if at this point they do persist uh, through time in any sense that is near to our contemporary metaphysics about uh, this issue so let me begin. Let me uh, let us start with, uh, with what is time. What he says is that, uh, and I mean slide five. Uh, now, in every case, there is uh, from any motion's starting point to its end point a certain possibility to cover that same distance by that motion um, that has the same speed. Indeed, this simply cannot be disputed. So it has been established that uh, between the starting point and the end point there is a certain definite possibility relative to the motion and the speed. Um, so the, the passage is very long, but um, I just put the, the, rather, the most important things. And he says, so we claim that it has turned out that the possibility is divisible, this possibility of covering a certain distance, and whatever is divisible is a certain magnitude or has a magnitude. And so this possibility is never stripped of a magnitude. However, it is not the magnitude of the mobile, so it has been uh, established that a certain magnitude exists, that is some possibility involving uh, motion between uh, what is earlier and later, occurring in such a way as to require a certain definite distances, and this possibility is not the magnitude of the mobile distance or motion itself. Now the magnitude cannot be something in itself, so it remains that it is a magnitude of a non-fixed disposition, and this is what we call time. So basically, what is he saying clearly is that time is a possibility, uh, which is to me very uh, bizarre and but interesting. Um, now, in, uh, in the literature, scholars have been divided as to whether this magnitude is identical to the possibility of covering a certain distance uh, and or has this magnitude. And for example, Lammer has rejected this and McGuinness has instead endorsed it. In fact, you can see in slide five um, on uh, in the middle, there is and whatever is divisible is a certain magnitude or has a magnitude. Um, and yeah, basically Avicenna himself is not uh, that clear. And that's why um, interpretation of his text have been so uh, different. Uh, different. Yeah, Lammer thinks that uh, this possibility has a magnitude and McGuinness thinks that this um, possibility is a magnitude. And I think McGuinness gives a more coherent reading of Avicenna's account on time, uh, and we will see that uh, later. But uh, just to give a hint, uh, one reason why Lammer, um, one argument that Lammer gives against this is, for example, that he gives the example of the tomato. And he says that certain possibilities are not divisible. For example, the possibility of the tomato to become uh, green. Um, and he says that is not divisible. But uh, we will see um, that based also on the account of uh, the way objects persist through time of Avicenna, 
which he says that they are subjects of these events, but we will see that. Uh, it is possible to, to divide this uh, change of, of, of the tomato from, from red to green into, into many events. And so basically, yeah, that is a possibility that is divisible. And this is exactly what, uh, what um, Avicenna is considering, a possibility that is divisible, and that is what we call time. So, but before going um, into the way objects persist through time, I also wanted to spot on another interesting thing that I found while I was reading uh, his text. Uh, and in fact, uh, um, there was a big issue in the Middle Age about uh, the concept of time because they had the, um, um, they received uh, the tradition of, of the Greeks, uh, especially from Aristotle. And then there was the notion of, of time as just being a measure of motion. And then that was elaborated a bit more in the, in the Middle Age because in fact, we didn't have, like uh, the physics was uh, changing a little bit in Aristotle, everything was fine because this uh, measure was the measure of the prime motion. And so we had the, the sense of time being uh, one and shared by every observer, which made sense, uh, at least in a pre-relativistic uh, framework. Um, and so also in the middle age, but then the physics started to change a bit. So we didn't have the, the first motion anymore. There were some, some problems also with the first motion itself. And, and, uh, and that was called in the Middle Age, the problem of the multi multiplicity of time because, um, and now I quote uh, my professor Por Porro who taught me all this. In the 14th century, a very rare solution, while it was generally accepted, it also underwent some radical elaboration. What seems to be unsatisfactory in actual fact, it is the succession of temporal parts of a motion that defines time as an accident of motion, that is a successive quantity of a motion. Every motion, not only the first motion of the heavens, displays a succession of temporal parts, so that if the time of a motion is its successive quantity, every motion has such a quantity. Therefore, time as a successive quantity is an accident of every motion and not only the first motion. And therefore, we will end up by having uh, multiple times and not uh, just one, based on, on how fast uh, these successive quantities uh, change and uh, and so on, um, which is actually very interesting for my other research in relativity because, okay, anyway. So um, Avicenna's uh, solution uh, instead is very interesting because uh, again, we have to think in relativistic terms. Um, he was able to, to give a game and a unity to this time. And he says, since it has turned out that time is not uh, something subsist subsisting in itself and the existence of whatever is like that depends upon matter, time is material. Now, although it is material, it exists in matter through the intermediacy of motion. And so if there is neither motion nor a change, there is no time. So if there is no vari variation or change in as much as something cheeses or something comes to be, nothing being uh, after or nothing being before time will not exist. In other words, time exists only together with the existence of the renewal of some state, where that renewal must be continuous, otherwise, again, there will be no time. So basically, what is he saying is that uh, the essence of time is different uh, from, from motion, as we have seen uh, for Avicenna, time is a possibility. Nonetheless, it's existing, and he says it's material, but of course, it doesn't mean that it's uh, an object that we can potentially touch or describe in uh, um, with the physical laws, but, but presumably we assume that. Um, so basically it's, um, it exists just together with, and he says in the last uh, two lines, with the renewal of some state, which, uh, which basically means that if there is any kind of motion whatsoever, then time independently exists. And in fact, there is a little bit of um, platonic descendants because I believe that he has this idea that time is one and a form, and, and this will become clear again when we will go through uh, the way objects persist through time. Uh, but basically, yes, uh, uh, now uh, this idea is uh, um, stripped from that of the first motion that doesn't, see, doesn't seem to have sense anymore. And um, Avicenna's solution is uh, to is this one, 
is to say basically that uh, time is a possibility essentially, but its existence comes together with the renewal or the motion of some state, uh, not uh, each of them. And so basically also his view is a little bit different from Aristotle because it's not uh, a measure of every single motion, but uh, it has a little bit of independency, but of course it also uh, is a measure of motion in general. So uh, again, why is that important? Uh, with uh, Avicenna, we have that, uh, with, with his solution, we have that time is an essential feature of motion. And that is how he avoids the problem of the multiplicity of time. Uh, so the time is not only what has a certain before and after, but is a possibility and it has intrinsically a before and after. And, and again, this is also um, clear, like uh, textually clear, clear because he says for motion, uh, namely being earlier and later, belongs to it on account of its substance. So uh, really essentially every uh, motion has this uh, essentially. And also for time turns out to have these uh, before and earlier parts essentially. So there is something um, like uh, more or less uh, being a human being is uh, something that is not different from every human being to, to one another, but um, more or less something like that. Uh, but I hope uh, it is clear. And by the way, feel free to interrupt me if if, if anything is not uh, clear. Uh, I don't know. Um, so the way things persist uh, through time. Um, again, I will just uh, quote him and and then give uh, some uh, comments. Uh, I'm at page at slide ten. Uh, he says uh, recognizing what it is to be in time also belongs to a discussion of things temporal and um, here he is just basically because this uh, um, up, uh, text are all from uh, the, his book of the healing and uh, it's, uh, which is which includes a lot of topics and he's just saying that uh, also the discussion on how things are in time is, should be put in the section of, of uh, time. So nothing in particular. And then he continues by saying, so we say something is in time precisely according to the preceding principles. Namely, it is understood as having earlier and later parts. Now the whole of what is understood as having earlier parts is either motion or something that undergoes motion. As for motion, that namely being earlier and later belongs to it on account of its uh, substance, whereas that belongs to the mobile on account of motion. So basically here is saying that uh, certain things have uh, these early related parts directly like motion and certain things they don't have it directly but indirectly through motion and these are the mobile and then here uh, is the analogy and uh, that uh, is uh, very interesting he says motion is in time as things that happen to be 10 are in tenness while the mobile is in time like the subject of the 10 things that are accidental with respect to the tenness and um it's clear so basically that motion uh, is uh, goes uh, with things that happen to be 10 in time with tenness and that's why I'm saying that uh, which has a little bit of uh, platonic influence as well because tenness clearly clearly um, uh, recalls uh, the, the form the platonic form of uh, beauty of uh, justice and tenness and uh, he's basically saying that time is somehow like a form, but it's not like a form because we have seen for him is like a possibility, but it has something universal because um, always uh, in the Middle Ages they thought that you know it's uh, universal and common for, for everyone. We, we, it's not uh, questionable this. And on the other hand, for the object, they say while the mobile is in time, like the subject of the 10 things, so basically saying that the mobile is in time, uh, by being the subject of the motion that are accidental with respect to, to the tennis. And again, here also there will be the question what, what he means by this. He means that um, the objects uh, are accidents of this form because they participate to, to this uh, based on you know, this platonic influence or does he mean something else? Um, yeah. Uh, basically, slide 11, I just say this, and uh, there are a, a, lo a lot of things to say about uh, what type of relation is this relation of participation being the subject, accidental and participants, but uh, what I want to do 
instead is to argue that uh, the um, theory of uh, persistence through time of Avicenna is transcendentist, um, and um, which is a contemporary view, uh, but I wanted to show that even earlier in time we, we had this. And uh, to, to explain this, I need to, to say a few words about four dimensionalism and three dimensionalism, and I'm at uh, slide 13. Uh, for uh, the um, four-dimensionalist account uh, is uh, a view basically that uh, about how the objects are and how they persist through time. And generally, we say that something persists if and only if uh, somehow or other it exists at various times. It is a neutral word. And then we say that something perdures if and only if it persists by having different temporal parts or stages at different times. Though no one part it is wholly present at more than one time. And four dimensionalism may then be formulated as the claim that necessarily each spatial temporal object has a temporal part at every moment at which it exists. This um, view, it uh, marries very well with, for example, uh, relativity. It's uh, very recent. And uh, what they are trying to say is basically that uh, um, uh, I am not wholly present. OK, uh, so. Um, there are um, stages of, of uh, many events of me and the meteorological sum of all of these is what uh, I am. Whereas on the other hand, three-dimensionalism, it says exactly the opposite. It says that uh, things endure. And by that, they, he mean, they mean that um, they persist by being wholly present at uh, more than one time. So basically now I'm wholly present and also a second before and a second later, I'm wholly present. Um, transcendentism is a variant of three-dimensionalism that also tries to, to, to put together four-dimensionalism as well, because um, they, uh, for, uh, Damiano Costa, who uh, is the one who uh, put this name on this theory and that actually read this paper and is my professor, he says that I take transcendentist theory of persistence to be the view that objects persist through time by being the participant of all temporal parts of their history. And where with the word participation, he means that the object that participate to these events are the subject of these events. And in fact, he says another important relation that events have in the one with the have with their subject, namely the object that uh, participate in them. So uh, basically, uh, in fact, uh, he he argued against me uh, because I wanted to say that he is a transcendentist that Avicenna uh, talks about earlier and later parts that seem to suggest that there are temporal parts also for, for Avicenna. But I believe that he, he cannot be um, compatible that easily with four-dimensionalism since uh, four-dimensionalism is a view that tends to be uh, compatible more with relativity and therefore we don't have this present, this unity of time, this absoluteness of time. Whereas for, for Avicenna, since he's a medieval uh, philosopher, it's uh, with like uh, ancient philosophers and whatever, most of them at least, um, there, there was the feeling that uh, at least time is one as, and, and universal. And uh, But likewise, tran this transcendentist who is also trying to do similar things, they are trying to keep uh, these temporal parts and slides, sli slices, but at the same time um, uh, arguing for, for the holiness of, of, of the object by keeping uh, the unity of, of, of the objects that are in time, like any objects um, or subjects or whatever. And they say basically that uh, uh, this totality is maintained by the subjectivity of, um, of, uh, of this relation that, uh, that uh, entities have with the event. Basically, they say that it's a relation of participation. Um, okay, uh, this is the, the last slide. Uh, I hope it is clear. It's, um, or somehow um, strikingly evident that there is um, striking similarity. In fact, uh, um, we, uh, Avicenna talks about uh, subjects that uh, participate to events and that, uh, that's how they are in time. And uh, again, as we have seen also, the transcendentist has uh, is saying the same thing. Of course, there are more things to say about, but, but I hope that more or less uh, it makes um, sense. And uh, that's it. This is a little bi biography, uh, slide uh, 16. And uh, thank you for the attention. And sorry again for, for me not being able to um, share my slide. <laughs>